Welcome to Yahoo Finance Presents Hispanic Stars. We're here with Alice Rodriguez, Managing Director at JP Morgan Chase. Alice, thanks so much for joining us. No, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. So let's talk about uh, COVID-19 and what's been happening with businesses. I know that you are chair-elect of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. What have you been noticing with businesses and specifically minority-owned businesses? You know, there's been a big, big challenge. Uh, you know, minority businesses did not get the same level of support that they perhaps thought they were going to get from a PPP perspective. And so when we have, you know, surveyed uh, the Hispanic owned businesses throughout the country, both those at scale, meaning over a million in sales versus, versus the ones that are not scaled, they have very similar challenges in the sense that they don't have enough cash reserves to get past, you know, six months. So in fact, when the uh, Latino Entrepreneurship, the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative that we partner with surveyed uh, Hispanic-owned businesses, 86% of them said that they were very nervous about the ability to get past the six months just because of the real lack of reserve. So uh, there's no question that it's impacted uh, minority businesses. I know that on the Latino-owned businesses, what you'll see is that we over-index in sectors that have really been hit hard by the pandemic, right? Retail, restaurants, you know, uh, even though construction was considered essential, some, you know, challenges there. So um, particularly because COVID itself impacted a lot of essential workers in the Latino community, the most hard hit demographic in the country right now are Latinos. And so it's just presented a lot of different challenges that, we're trying to really bucket into different areas so that we can understand what's the best way we can support them. And Fed Chair Jerome Powell has spoken about income inequality as one of the biggest challenges that the U.S. faces. What are your thoughts on that? How can we solve some of that? Yeah, I mean, there's no question. When you look at the median net worth uh, for a black household, for instance, it's 17,000. For a Latino household, it's 21,000. And for a white household, it's 171,000. And when you start to look at the key drivers of the why behind that, I think that's where we're going to have to really think through, like, how to support our communities best. So, for instance, uh, Latino households really uh, lean on uh home buying, right, or owning their home as a way to build wealth in their in their uh, household and helping them to think about more liquid savings, right, and the ability to build that savings and build wealth. You know, entrepreneurship is another way that a lot of Latino households uh, really build their wealth. So I think it's about first supporting those key levers that they already use to build wealth and then figuring out what are the right policies and the right, you know, uh, do we have the right products so that everybody can take advantage of how you build wealth over time. And it's often said that during recessions, new businesses can be built, new ideas come out of downturns. Do you feel that way? I mean, what are you seeing as far as entrepreneurship or smaller businesses during COVID-19? No, I, I think that I absolutely believe that there's innovation. And I'll give you an example. I mean, you see so much out there regarding uh, air quality and being able to um, have the right, you know, filters from an HVAC perspective, the right purifiers, you know, as the science comes around, right, on how to really prevent the spread of COVID-19. And so uh, I recently met this entrepreneur whose uh, job was um, cleaning air ducts. And so that's what he was doing prior to COVID. But as COVID has happened, right, he's been able to shift more and to learn more about, you know, the technology that's required to have the right HVAC uh, filters. And I'm sorry, because I don't know the name of the filter he was, he was telling me, but there's a lot of great uh, information and science that supports having the right filters. So this has allowed him, as he has pivoted a little bit more, he's still doing air ducts. He's gotten the opportunity now to do more commercial work, whereas before he was more focused on residential, right, as he was helping, you know, uh, clients keep their air ducts clean. So I just thought that was a good example. And you see that happening everywhere. Manufacturing is another good example. You know, we see at the chamber the opportunity perhaps to find businesses that can go more into the manufacturing sector as we think about uh, some of the manufacturing that perhaps can be moved back uh, to the U.S. So 
I do think that through sometimes crisis, right, and in this case, I see some tragedy, that you see some good output uh, come out as a result of it. You mentioned earlier Hispanics and building wealth. What are some other ways that Hispanics can build wealth, especially during these times? I mean, it starts with savings. I mean, at the end of the day, all of the research that I've done just on financial health says the most important predictor of good financial health is savings. And the reason we say that, right, is that if you have a rainy day, like anything happens, in this case, a horrific pandemic, right, if you do not have a rainy day fund, if you have no savings built up, you will most likely have to go to like borrowing money or selling something to be able to do that. And people get into a spiral that is very hard to get out. You tend to start paying more for credit as a result of that. And so it's just like this, this um, ripple effect that doesn't allow you to, to, uh, to move forward. So it doesn't sound real exciting, you know, when you tell people like, you just need to save more, but it's the truth. And I always think about my own upbringing, you know, neither one of my parents had the opportunity to attend high school. You know, they had at best a, a middle school education, but they were good savers. They were good savers because they had uh, what I would like categorize as more seasonal work, seasonal work, right? And so when you do that, they were just very disciplined about knowing, like my father was a shrimper and my mother did all sorts of jobs. You know, she did migrant work. She sold tamales to the neighbors. She did what she had to, right? To put, they both did, to put food on the table. But they also knew that every time they had money, they put some away. And so I feel like I saw that growing up. And as a result, right, that was sort of the habit that I've had, which is always like, save first, pay yourself first. And then, right, you're able to, to, uh, to, build more resiliency to be able to do other things in the future. And so anyway, I just use that as an example, because sometimes when I even tell my own kids who are adults now, like how important savings is, they're like, mom, no, I want something more, you know, exciting, like going into the market and all that. And that is important too, by the way, but you can't do that until you have the fundamentals down. And talking about your background, it's so fascinating. What inspired you to go into banking? Is it what you just said, your parents saving a lot? I mean, what were some of the inspirations that led you down the career path you went through? You know, um, I was the first one in my family to graduate from college and I got a business degree. Uh, but like most students coming out of college, it's not like I had, I knew a lot, you know, about about stuff, about life and, and stuff. And one of the reasons, um, it's not like I wanted to go into banking, to be honest, so that I could be a banker. Um, I just thought that uh, growing up, the one thing I really wanted to do, and this is not, again, going to sound really exciting and sexy, but it's the truth, is, you know, as a young girl spending time in Chicago, my mother used to do some migrant work with her family in Indiana, and so she would take me and my um, siblings with her. And I remember going to see this, at back then it was the Sears Tower. Um, I think it's something else now. And, you know, from a young girl from South Texas who the tallest building in her, you know, uh, city was three stories, literally, you know, going to Chicago and seeing all these things, all these buildings so tall, really like was um, a big deal for me. But anyway, when my aunt took us to the Sears Tower, the one thing I noticed was that everybody going into that building was dressed up with a briefcase, all, you know, nice. And I had no idea what they did, right? But I just said, that's pretty cool. And when I asked my aunt, how come nobody in our family works at the Sears Tower? Like everybody is like, you know, doing more manual labor type jobs, whether that's working at the meatpacking plant or, you know, having to do migrant work or whatever. And I don't think I ever got an answer. And I was just a kid. So it, even if I got one, I don't think I would uh, exactly remember everything. But it just said to me, like, whatever you do, like, get a job where you can work at a cool place like the Sears Tower. And, you know, that was my ultimate goal. But the reason I, I went at the bank is, A, was in the mid-80s, and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of job opportunities. It, we were in the recession back then, too, because Texas had a real estate bus and an oil bus. But I figured that it would be a good place to meet bankers so that when I became an entrepreneur, which is still a goal of mine, <laughs> believe it or not, um, I would know a lot of the right people uh, to, to get the money that I needed to start my business. An entrepreneur in what field, doing what exactly? You know what? I, 
I really, um, I really don't know. I mean, the, the great thing about uh, in my career was the ability to manage business banking. And um, I spent some time in California after we acquired Washington Mutual. And the thing that inspired me the most there is just how innovative people are. Like, you know, they would just get an idea about like, hey, we should be manufacturing this or we should be um, helping in this way. And they just did it. And they took all their life savings and they took a dream and they made it a reality. And that was always super inspirational to me. You know, I think about right now, I think about things back to your point about how do I help Um, educate and raise money so that we have more people in our minority communities that would be able to to fulfill their dream. And so particularly right now, right, where there is a real need for capital as people are trying to pick themselves back up after COVID. And is there a way, uh, for instance, to educate our minority communities, communities about the different sources of capital and then have the right, you know, funds out there to be able to help them accomplish that. So not just debt, but also teach them about how important it is to have, you know, equity um, owners in helping them to grow and advance their businesses. And what advice would you give to Hispanics and Hispanic women who would want to reach your position? I would say, you know, the very first thing is remember that, you know, you can't do it by yourself. You know, there's always this tendency to maybe think about like, oh, I should know all the answers as I'm going forward towards this thing, you know, and I have found that when you have like a very small center of people that are your truth tellers, it's just a good way to bounce things off. I think the second thing is like, just take the risk. Like, look, we're all a little nervous or a little scared to try something new and, um, if you never even attempt it for the fear of being rejected, you know, you're just, it, it, there's just so much learning that comes from it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so I know in my career where, you know, I literally had people like really encouraging me and I would try something. And then when you first get that rejection, it's like really hard, but after that, it just makes it easier and you uh, tend to really, you know, build uh, confidence. And I think like the third thing that I would say is, you know, just stay, you know, consistent and persistent on those things that you really want. Because a lot of times, right, we talk ourselves out of it. You know, we just start to think about like how, quote, hard it's going to be. And I would just say, you know, you get knocked down, you just get right back up and you just try again. Great advice. Alice Rodriguez, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you.